the topic we want to start with today is sustainability. Now, sustainability is it's not just something that's important for research infrastructures. It's something that we struggle with. It's something that is uh, key to being able to deliver in the long term, which is a key to be able to, being able to deliver for humanities research. But it's also something that is very difficult in the digital environment. We knew how to do sustainability when we were working with libraries and with print publications. With the new research infrastructure models, we have a little bit more of a challenge. So, if you look into the literature, you find there's a number of perspectives out there on sustainability. Uh, but they're largely focusing on sustainability as one thing, or as the research infrastructure as one thing. So if you look, for example, to digital libraries, there's some wonderful work done from the digital library community, and it focuses a lot on, for example, the technical aspects or the project management for sustainability. Um, things like data interoperability, and particularly this data and metadata aspect of sustainability. Now that's very important, but when you look at a virtual research infrastructure, you're going to find it's far more than just data and it's far more than just a technical platform. So the digital library perspective is slightly difficult for us to apply in terms of a research infrastructure. You'll also find specific work about research infrastructures, <clears throat> but what's interesting about this is it tends to focus really on one thing. So a research infrastructure is many things, as we've discussed, but if you focus on it as one thing and you sustain it as one thing, then you'll find again you're Giving, giving it less opportunity to have the long-term value that it could have. So for example, you will find um, work that focuses on how the research infrastructure acts as an organization. So looking at business models, for example, and sustainable funding. Um, you'll find technical perspectives. So how do you actually keep the technical infrastructure up and running, which are very important, but not the entirety of the research infrastructure. And finally, you'll find things about, for example, communication and branding, and you'll find all these links in the extra, extra information. So when we have the opportunity with the Sindari project to look at this set of perspectives and to try and go beyond it, we decided we would try and develop a new paradigm. So Sindari was a research infrastructure project closely allied to the Daria Eric, so one of these long-term research infrastructures, and it is also one of the partners in the Parthenos project. And under the Sindari project, in coordination with Daria, we developed a new paradigm for looking at sustainability. We decided to look at sustainability as a process rather than a state. We decided to look at it as a process that had the goal of reuse, not just that it would be there, but that it would find its users, and that was very important for us. And finally, we looked at it as something that was occurring across a number of asset classes. So we decided to break the research infrastructure down into component parts and actually look at those parts as having value in and of themselves. So the result of this was a toolkit for sustainability, and this is the work I'll be presenting to you now. Um, it was developed in the context of the Sindari project, but of of course, it will be much more applicable to a wide range of projects, even those that are perhaps a smaller scale than Sundari was. So first of all, looking at this concept of sustainability as a planning exercise, sustainability as a process. Now, I mentioned that Sundari had this foundational relationship with the Daria Eric, and this is something I would encourage anyone building a research infrastructure project to think about, because you need to have something that will go beyond the short-term funding. Um, we can build a lot with short-term funding, but we can't sustain in short-term funding, and funders are very reluctant, and understandably so, to actually put money into a project which has already closed. So actually having that kind of relationship set from the beginning is an important way of implementing a sustainability process. Now, the process also had a time frame. We set ourselves a goal of doing this within 18 months, the final 18 months of the project, although obviously many of the agreements were in place, and we took this modular approach that I mentioned. And this allowed us to not only think in terms of the reuse of the project results in many different ways, but also to capture the complexity and the richness of the tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is something research infrastructures struggle with. In the old days, in the traditional knowledge infrastructure, you would go to the archivist, you would go to the librarian for that extra knowledge. In the digital world, we don't have those same abilities to access the individual who has that knowledge in their head. So we felt it was important that we would flush out the tacit knowledge. So, in terms of how we would recommend that people put processes in place, we would say start early 
and build it in from the beginning. Build it into your planning from the beginning and focus on reuse. Focus on reuse of knowledge, tacit or otherwise. Focus on reuse of standards. Focus on reuse of data and focus on reuse of code. Anything that you build will be more easy to reuse, it, reuse if it is open and if it is available for others. And if you start planning from the beginning and take this as a, a project level value, then you'll have an easier time delivering that. Um, you should know your knowledge. You have to know what the project knows and talk about that. Make that an explicit part of the project work. And of course, things like data management planning are very important to supporting this sort of long-term sustainable reuse process. So that's another part of the planning that is very important, although we won't go into it in any detail here. And finally, one of the other things that we decided was for the portal, for the core output that we had, really going beyond a three to five year window was not realistic because for various reasons, either that work would have to be taken forward in a new way or it would have to be revised and reused or you'd have to admit that it wasn't getting the use you expected within that time. So the idea that in three to five years you'd revisit the sustainability plan and look at that reuse and see where it was actually going, we felt that that was an important further value to get into this process. So I was speaking before about asset classes. So what are the things that a research infrastructure has and builds and offers for reuse? And of course, on the one hand, you have the tangible assets, things like the data, the archival research guides, which were these publications we developed in Sundari, and other forms of publication. And those usually have some place already where they're, they're, they're available. Um, but there's also the intangible assets, the processes, the best practice, the know-how, the communities. And very often these are the things that we lose at the end of a project. So we decided that for the Sundari purposes, we would break down these assets into four specific classes. The technical infrastructure, including portal services and tools. The research data, which we looked at as both the unique data that we had created in the project, but also aggregated data. So data that we didn't own, but that we had brought together and in some ways added value to in that way. We looked at the publications and knowledge. So we had <clears throat> these specific archival research guide publications. We had also um, papers and reports and other things that came out of the project, but also toolkits, know-how, management data, other things like that, that we felt we didn't necessarily know what the value was, but we felt there was a potential re reuse value there. And finally, we looked at the communities, people, networks, and relationships. We had brought a lot of people together in the course of that project. And how were we going to be able to sustain that momentum? Because that was going to be really what was going to lead to the reuse of the project, was that people talking to each other, people seeing each other's work. So each of these asset classes had its own sustainability planning underneath the larger strategy. So for example, with the portal, as I mentioned, we decided to look at a three to five year window and our partner Daria agreed to sustain the portal for that period of time as it was in a complete uh, form. Now that was really important because not only did that allow us to say, okay, this is going to be there for a period of time, but it also forced us to think about, well, what happens if something goes wrong? Because when you're not in a period of active development, sometimes you have to look at the technical sustainability slightly differently. So we also had plans for the case of failure or the case of any component needing to be removed. So we really looked at it again as a modular thing. And that modular approach was quite important to us as well for two other ways that we manifested this technical infrastructure. So first of all, we made it available as a virtual machine. So anyone who wanted to rebuild their own version of the full portal could with their own data or with their own tools and services. And that's available, as I said, as a Sendari in a box installation. And then finally, we made sure that tools and services, some of which would have their own place where you could access them independently on the web, but others of which would not, that they would all be available for reuse and further development. And we used GitHub as a place to share that, that software. So really in looking at this, the important things were to, first of all, identify a partner who's going to keep that basic set of of, of technical components running as a service. Um, and we were realistic about how much time that was going to take. And we also designed the infrastructure in a way that single elements could be reused or the full thing could be reused. Again, imagining the widest possible set of future users. Finally, we also made sure that the technical documentation of the tools and their integration was openly available. Again, this feels like a hygiene factor to suggest, just as having a data management plan seems like a hygiene factor to suggest. But it is something that can really assist and be a strong support for further reuse if 
there are, 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 are needs or requirements um, that you can't foresee, but that are actually covered in the technical documentation. So the next topic, the next asset class was the Sundari data. Many research infrastructures, in particular in Europe, will have unique and aggregated data as a part of what they do. And we always viewed our data as what we called a data soup. So there was a lot of different kinds of data, and it was coming from institutions, it was coming from researchers, it was coming from in different formats. We had metadata, we had full text, we had ontologies in our, our linked data resources. So it was quite a, a heterogeneous um, data environment that we had. So in order to uh, sustain this, we came up with a series of recommendations about data as well. So again, openness, standards, using the formats that are going to support reuse, that are going to support future aggregation. Don't think of your project as an endpoint, because it might be for you today, but going forward, it might be someone else's starting place. So again, finding those partners that can already help you to think about the reuse of your data is very important. Um, with unique data, we tried to share it widely, um, preferably with our users. So we offered any data transformations back to the cultural heritage institutions that owned the original data. And this was really important. Now, they weren't always able to use that. They weren't always able to integrate that. But they were very often able to recognize the value in it and would take that deposit back. Um, in terms of the social structures, again, this is an important thing to, to build in. Uh, having things like documented use policies, having things um, that could support trust between yourselves and any other data holders was very important to what we did and something that we struggled with in the beginning and had to work to achieve. Um, finally, making sure that the data ingestion cycle is very clear and that it can be managed going forward without significant further development. And of course, that the, what you have collected and what you've collected it for is also clear in your own minds so that you know exactly what this data is going to be useful for. You may not have the imagination to see every possible use case, but if you're looking forward to it as someone's future research data, then you have a better chance of figuring out how best to place that data in multiple places in order for it to be reused. So the next asset class we dealt with were the idea of publications and knowledge. Now, publications in some ways are easy. Um, if you have it published through a journal, the journal will make sure that that publication stays accessible. But we also had training material, which is available on the project website and was integrated into the use of the final portal. And also management data, which is kind of a, an interesting documentation of the, the project management as its own kind of, of commitment and its own kind of knowledge base within a project like this. We had an archival research guide. So these archival research guides are complex multimedia digital objects that exist in a bespoke framework, um, which is also tied into the note-taking environment in Sundari. So this was a real particular challenge, is to decide well, how best to not only preserve them, not, how best to not only make sure that they remain available, but how best to embed them in the scholarly communities that should use them and reuse them for knowledge creation. And finally, we had the tacit knowledge, um, which includes things like the project failures um, or the project challenges and how we met them, even if we didn't quite feel that this was something where we created new knowledge, but where we actually created significant new processes to work through a very, very messy and changing landscape. So in terms of the sustainability of the project knowledge capital, um, we wanted to make sure that the research work could be accessed reliably uh, in a variety of easy to find relevant formats in locations. So making sure that things were available in a repository and making sure that things were published where relevant and where the publications were different. Um, so for instance, with these archival research guides, we would look for an external validation of them perhaps in the form of a peer review, perhaps in the form of a consultation, to make sure, again, that we were embedding these into the structures that would allow them to be reused, that we weren't letting any barriers be there. Um, building in a tacit knowledge audit was actually a really interesting process for us. Um, about 12 months before the end of the project, we asked all of the project leaders to actually talk to their teams and say, well, look, is there anything that we've learned that we are at risk of taking with us when we adjourn in the project? And a number of things came out of this. For example, we had a, a publication about dealing with archives. We have published it as a white paper, as a report, but still it's something that we refer back to a lot because it really outlines 
that um, series of steps that we had to go through to come to understand what the, the, the tensions were between traditional cultural heritage institutions and our new model of data aggregation. Um, as before, connecting directly, finding the other projects, the other networks, the other people, the other institutions that will be your future users and working with them from the beginning is very important. And of course, ensuring that your data manage, your management data, so the, 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 the minutes and all these things that seem unimportant at the time, the teaching resources, that everything that you produce becomes a part of that larger data management plan. And finally, the last set of assets of the project that we looked at were the communities and networks. Research infrastructures, because of their size, have a tendency to build communities around them. And as I've said again and again, they need to interact with communities in order to make sure that they are embedded and able to reach a maximal level of reuse. So realizing that the, 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 the full reach of a research infrastructure may be bigger than you can even see from within it. So for us, we had the other research infrastructures we worked with, we worked with other funded projects, there were a number of scholarly networks that we were involved with, um, the cultural heritage institutions, and of course, aggregator networks of the cultural heritage institutions, plus we had our social media networks, and of course, the users that we brought into the project over the course of time. We felt that to simply let these assets dissipate, to let this, this, this sense of common cause, this base of understanding about what Sundari was and did, would have been a real loss of something that should have been built upon. So in order to maintain the, and sustain these networks, we also decided that we would first of all maintain a central communication point, even after project close. It was important that somebody or a group of people would still say, yes, we are committed to seeing this go forward. Um, but we also wanted to find a context or a platform to foster that dialogue. So for us, um, the Daria Eric has a mechanism of a working group, and we decided that we would reform ourselves as a working group, and that gives us a platform to meet occasionally, to access small amounts of funding, but also primarily to keep our dialogue going, um, to make sure that we're looking at different funding, looking at extensions of our users, looking at extensions of our data. Even if we don't have a lot of money to invest, we do have a bit of time to invest, and that's really important for making sure that the legacy of this project and the accessibility of this project are sustained. Um, we also have um, simple instruments to allow end users to contact us. So we had a very, very elaborate bug, porting, bug reporting system uh, within the project lifetime, um, but now we have something quite simple to let people contact us. And that's important as it not seeming like a barrier um, if you find something in the system that is either confusing or maybe something that has deteriorated. So it's important for that, that um, access to be able to come back to us. So by taking this approach, not of seeing the research infrastructure as one thing or even as maybe two things, but trying to be creative about the full range of views of the research infrastructure and its value that we looked at. Um, this allowed us to create quite a different and robust sustainability plan, but also to learn a lot about what it means to sustain these digital research infrastructures going forward.